I'm going to talk about, well, using the various incarnations of the, what I'm just calling the Palestine Archaeological Museum in Jerusalem to sort of, as a sort of case study in colonialism and archaeology and all that sort of thing. Oh, I accidentally jumped forward too far. It was founded in 1901 in the Ottoman Empire as part of the Museums of Antiquities and their Imperial Museum, which was the big one based in Istanbul, sort of like our British Museum. And I suggest that the museum sort of falls under Bruce Trigger's definition of imperial archaeology, which states, imperialist or world-oriented archaeology is associated with a small number of states that enjoy or have exerted political dominance over large areas of the world. And while it's not the most perfect definition, it, I think, helps to explain the situation here, particularly with regards to the British, as even during the Ottoman Empire, it was before the British mandate, they had no sort of official control over everything, but they still dominated archaeology in Palestine through particularly through institutions such as the Palestine Exploration Fund. And I think a lot of this goes back to this sort of British sense of ownership and connection to Palestine as the Holy Land. They sort of used the terms interchangeably, pretty much. And this is what I'm getting at. This is a quote from the Archbishop of York in 1865 at the foundation of the Palestine Exploration Fund. And in particular, the first sentence there, this country of Palestine belongs to you and me. It is essentially ours. And the photograph in the background is the Jerusalem Survey Party from Charles Warren, Joseph Warren, loads of people there. And they were sponsored by the Palestine Exploration Fund to do a survey of Jerusalem and later on there was the survey of Western Palestine which mapped the in entire country well, from the West Bank onwards and it sort of they were the definitive maps of Palestine and what was defined as Palestine from sort of the end of the 19th century onwards and as part of a reaction to this the Ottoman state developed stricter antiquities laws and it was not just what was going on in Palestine there were other excavations in I think particularly Troy and Ephesus, and when you go to the British Museum, there's a lot of stuff from there, and they were like, why are you taking all this stuff? We want... So then it was all part of the, sort of, around that period that... It's gone. Hmm. Has it? The Ottoman period was going through... The Ottoman Empire was going through... I think it's just... It's dead. Is it? Sorry. <laughs> It was going through a series of sort of modernization reforms and trying to portray themselves as a modern European empire and equal to the Western European powers. And this involved their fantastic imperial museum, as you can see, it's designed in the neoclassical, very European style. And it was the director was Osman Hamdi Bey, who was something of what people term an Ottoman Orientalist. He was sort of quite sort of European orientated and I just love that picture for me, so just relaxing on the massive <laughs> They sponsored quite a few excavations and had this grand museum and they also decided that they needed local museums across the empire and that was where the Jerusalem Museum came in. And jump forward again. <laughs> they, had, they had a few years of this sort of little museum in Jerusalem. It didn't get much attention, particularly didn't get any attention really in British guidebooks, which I think is interesting, but when you look at the very close relationship. I thought you had the other one on the dock. Yeah. You just tap the top. Yeah. There we go. Does that work? Yeah. <laughs> there was a very close relationship between the Palestine Exploration Fund and Thomas Cook. 
they're travel people, so that's probably why they didn't get in the guidebook, because the Palestine Exploration Fund also wanted to do their own museum, which was pretty much overtly dedicated to biblical archaeology. So there's a slight conflict there. Then World War I happened, and the British gained control of Palestine. And part of this sort of imperial narrative of we are the great victors, we are securing Palestine for the civilised world, and this is illustrated, I think, by Edmund Allenby, who famously walked through the gate in Jerusalem, the photograph behind there, and emphasised the, sort of the care and the protection that the British would give to the sacred nature of Jerusalem, and particularly the buildings and the sort of historic nature. And here's a quote from him here. And it's, though it's, it's interesting to note that the antiquities legislation excluded sort of currently in use religious buildings. They weren't sort of protected in the same way. And it's this sort of protective in a slightly patronising, well incredibly patronising way that the British used with regards to archaeology. In 1919, John Garstang, the professor of theories and methods of archaeology at the University of Liverpool, was sent around to create a report for the future of archaeology in Palestine. And this is a detail from it, including the keeper of museums, the keeper of monuments. It's about 20 pages, I think, incredibly <laughs> detailed report. And he was, this is all before the mandate got declared in 1922, so they were getting in there early. And a sentence in Garstang's report, which emphasises this superiority of the British and their role, they saw themselves as the great emancipators of Palestine. He states, popular sentiment at home and abroad, which under the almost passive negligence of the Turkish regime remained calm, will not tolerate any appearance of neglect now that the country is emancipated. And it's this idea that the British were incredibly superior to the Turks. They were the Westerners. They were the inheritors of this great civilization, and they would protect the antiquities better. And it's in this context that they took over the museum. And this is an extract from a military report from Ronald Storrs, one of the, he was the first military governor. And I'm not sure if you can read it, but it says, in order to safeguard antiquities and to put into practical effect, proclamation at present, I believe, before, I'm not entirely sure what that means. He sort of has an entire little, like, letter. This is an emergency communication in occupied territory from 1918, he had plans to create a museum in the citadel at Jerusalem. And he's, in this letter, he's saying he's making plans to safeguard the antiquities and store them safely. He also states in the same letter, I'm about to set aside certain rooms in the Citadel Museum for purposes of the safeguarding of antiquities. And this military elite, we have people like Ronald Storrs and Alan B. They were very interested in antiquities. It was sort of, I'd say more than a hobby. It was almost sort of related to their presence there. I mean, Alan B. himself would speak at the opening of the Mandate Museum. And many government records make clear the importance of heritage to the post-war political project of the British, which I think was mostly propaganda. And this is an example of such. It's from a memo on the Joint Archaeological Joint Committee on Proposal for the International Control of Antiquities Existing in Countries Under Turkish Rule, which is basically the Western governments getting together and saying, what are we going to do with all these antiquities we know best? And in particular, I think the phrase there is that we are the inheritance of the whole civilised world. It goes back to this sort of everything is related to civilization and Western Europe is the pinnacle of civilization and we know better than the people who live there. And that is missing. I don't know what to that. Oh, it's turned up now. So these are more sort of examples from newspapers on the opening of the 
So it's quite sort of push in the press to be like, hey, we're opening this new museum. Isn't it really? this, and I particularly like this one for the headline. It's called Seeking Palestinian Antiquities Called the English Duty. But it's the duty of Great Britain as the mandatory power to, for Palestine to explore Palestine's antiquities. And this was expressed by Allenby himself, who was referred to there as conqueror of Jerusalem. And there's another, this is from an article by Garth Thang himself, you can hear about four of them, they're like the Illustrated London News, they're very detailed, these sort of, because he set up the Department of Antiquities in the museum and they were all sort of mixed up together, which caused quite a bit of confusion later on. And he says that, you know, we cannot help but feel reassured as to Britain's fulfilment of her trust as these are reports on sort of how archaeology is progressing in Palestine now that it's more under our control than what's going on. So in so finally they got a place for the museum and they opened it here. It was quite a small museum and very traditional as you can see. But it was still sort of trumpeted in the paper as this amazing museum. So what is interesting is that the, Brit the British deliberately positioned themselves in opposition to the Ottomans, because the vast majority of the collection here was inherited from the Ottomans. They had taken care of it, it was in their museum, it was all catalogued. Yeah, you have reports in the Sir Herbert Samuel's speech, he states, passing to the history of the museum, he pointed out how different our policy was to that of the Turk. And it's this public nature of this very high profile figure at the, it was said at the opening of the museum, that we are so different from the Ottomans and the Turkish, we are better at this. You have another display in the museum. And there's one story I think sort of highlights it all, is there's this story of these missing cases of antiquities, which weren't really missing. <laughs> they were discovered, I think, in the, I'm not entirely sure where, they found about a hundred maybe more cases of crates of antiquities, which the official line was that they had been packed away by the Ottomans to be shipped to uh, Istanbul or Constantinople there, or a few of the reports say they were going to be shipped to Germany. And the narrative is that W.J. Pythian Adams, who was the first director of the museum, it's the fancy photo of him there, you know, the world's worst suit for wearing it in excavation, <laughs> claiming that there was no record of these, no one knows where they're here, they were trying to like, secretly sneak them away back to Istanbul or again possibly Germany and he makes a big deal of that he spent all this time creating a catalogue of it all. However, in the archives of the, what is now the archives of the Rockefeller Museum, so they would have, which is the, what the museum is now, there is a page from the Ottoman catalogue which is exactly the same antiquities. You can and as it's ended up in the Rockefeller, it's incredibly likely that they knew it was there or it was there and they were just incredibly unlucky or a bit daft and he spent hours, weeks, months doing this and it was all there. Particularly as the Ottoman Museum was, a lot of the catalogue was worked on by F.J. Bliss, who was an American archaeologist who worked with the Palestine Exploration Fund and ended up actually getting fired by the Palestine Exploration Fund as he was working too closely with the Ottomans on this very museum. So people knew, they knew there was something there. It's not sort of complete ignorance of we have no idea these antiquities have turned up out of nowhere, which is what they seem to do. And they've sort of, the museum was like launched with this great fanfare. It's amazing. And there's a plan of the museum and then shows how tiny it is compared to the Rockefeller Museum floor plan because that room was probably about the size of that room, I'm guessing. I don't have any of the dimensions. 
So the Fun Fairy is Amazing Great Museum, which is pretty tiny. But this doesn't last long, because by the mid-1920s, that Garstang is writing in 1927 that the department and the museum have been left in the lurch without so much as a thank you. They seem to have sort of perpetually no money at all. And a visitor, uh, I think he was ex-government or military, this guy called William Basil Worsfold, he tours various archaeological sites in Palestine and he visits the museum and just has like, quite a long rant on how it's got no money anymore, they've completely abandoned it, what's going on. It seems completely contradictory to this media narrative that everyone's playing. The British, they're so brilliant, we're looking after everything so much better than the Ottomans ever could, and the museum has no money. And they try to sort of publicise it a lot. Like these letters to hotels, from Thomas Cook and a sort of tour of Palestine. Come to Palestine. It's British now, you can practice lots of tourism. And that again, it was part of the British sort of, we're so brilliant and benevolent. They deliberately made a point of having all the tours in Arabic, Hebrew and English. Though I've looked at some sort of visitor figures from I think about the beginning of the 1930s and hardly anyone visited. But eventually they were saved by the massive investment of millions of dollars by the American John D. Rockefeller, who built the Rockefeller Museum, which is still there today, and this is a massive spread in music in a magazine, Jerusalem's New Treasure House. And again, this is still portrayed as how amazing the British are, despite the fact that they've had to be rescued by this donation from an American and because the whole museum was skin and they had absolutely no money and they were running out of places to store antiquities, no one was visiting, it was sort of a bit of a disaster really, but they still managed to keep control of this narrative of we're on top of it, we're looking after things so much better than the Turks. And this is the Rockefeller Museum today and interestingly I found a little plaque which sort of says the museum takes a long visitor back in time to the beginnings of archaeological investigation in the Holy Land, which I think, in some ways I think it's true, and in other ways I'm not sure if it's just like that because they can't be bothered to update it as they now have the big Israel museum on the other side of the city. And that's quite <coughs> interesting. I think that still, what I take away from this is that throughout this whole narrative of the changing hands of the museum from the Ottomans to the British that pretty much the Palestinians are absent. The museum, both the Ottoman Museum and the British Museum were aimed at sort of local elites, either Ottoman or British or tourists, there doesn't seem to be, despite all their tours in Arabic, they don't seem to make much effort. And I think a lot of the publicity it's the museum didn't exist so much to be the museum. It existed as something that we can tell people back home in all these newspapers and our fancy magazine spreads of this is how well the British are managing everything. We're so much better, even though on the ground, the situation was quite different. And that is everything.